Yeah, so why manufacturers need to digitize and structure their data? Um, I think worthwhile reminding um, when we talk about manufacturing, construction, uh, we talk about built environment and the, some of the issues um, we've been genuinely built environments been suffered over the decades, like obviously the low profit margin, productivity, high cost failure, but also uh, disruptions uh, around new materials, new way of workings, complex ecosystem. Um, Duncan, you mentioned it earlier, this is it's a very complex uh, industry. And we also face in talent shortage and skills gap. Um, and then we, I haven't put it in there, and, but I have it on the next slide. We obviously faced uh, unprecedented times with COVID. And we still have the long, as far as I remember, issues around delivering buildings, assets that uh, emit on average 3.8 times higher carbon emissions than they were designed to. Um, we have a kind of lack of intelligence across the different project life cycles. And we simply need to better build better performing building with less resources and quicker. And the kind of the three messages you've been reading quite a lot, but you know, here we are 20, 21, we're still talking about the performance gap. So obviously, I did mention the COVID uh, really has exposed um, how the supply chain is uh, is weak, how it's, uh, how it's causing the, the issues around the complexity, the lack of real-time information, data and external alerts. So um, then built environment can react, react quickly to, um, to different business challenges. And this is obviously, it's been a, a real business challenge, challenge and test for everyone. And IBM did some research around uh, some of the questions and there was a clear answer from different um, stakeholders around uh, that executives believe that they need to understand, they need to automate yeah, the kind of the supply chain, they need to understand the data, they need to start treating data as an asset so they can be much more efficient, they can optimize their operating models uh, based on basically the the different the different external um, sort of situations, which one of them being COVID. And genuinely what we also seen is that even the uh, the most skeptical uh, sort of executives or even companies um, and which would not embrace necessarily digitalization or would not embrace technology at all. They really now look into it, look into data, look into see what they can do, how they can change to actually cope with this current crisis. And I and I picked up this uh, this slide from the McKinsey report around the some of the key use cases in construction industry, uh, and you can see they are grouped into uh, into obviously the biggest one around the back office, around digital collaboration, different tools, on-site executions, and there's, it, it's good to see some of the highlights are um, around the 3D printing, supply chain optimization, and marketplaces. Um, so it's it's. It is something um, the industry is looking at and investors are looking at as well quite a lot, including 3D printing, modernization, AI analytics, and obviously now the big buzzwords, uh, digital twins. But um, what I think here I'd like to highlight is the importance of seeing the manufacturing is complex, uh, not just seeing BIM, but also seeing the, the back office processes, um, the on-site executions and the different uh, ways of collaboration down to a simple, like you see on the number 20, document management. And we have also seen uh, at, at uh, genuinely across um, the, the business, uh, across the, the built environment, a, a real growth in uh, new IPs being created and new startups are crowding mark the market. They, it has obviously, it's also, it's, 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 it's benefits, but also disadvantages. I mean, I do recall uh, digital construction weeks, 2016, 17, 18, and, and it, you would probably meet companies, new startups, maybe at 2017, and there would be different startups in 2018. Possibly you would not see the ones um, attended in 2016. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a ve very, I think, I, I believe it's a really exciting industry to be in, but the underlining, again, the topic is data is, is, is now the new oil of the industry. 
and the market is growing um, the and the investments are floating in and and new players uh, including IBM Microsoft uh, Google are now looking into this industry and try to take it and really digitize it and and, and you would see in next uh, next week and next coming weeks you would see some exciting announcements coming up from the different players how they're trying to address this industry from actually bottom up so the strategy, I try to summarize some of the strategic market shifts for the construction materials manufacturing, which is affecting uh, manufacturers. It is obviously around the data. So the new different data um, um, aggregators, we can call it, or the, the different data topics you mentioned. Uh, in one of the articles, we did talk about the different platforms, so not just BIM platforms, but different digital twin platforms, applications, data pools as well. So we see in a lot of distributions and merchants creating their own data pools, their own data applications, aggregating uh, the, the data and then uh, reselling it further, using it, manipulating it in a, in a, in a, in a way which we cannot probably control. Um, we also see in the new regulation standards, and I'll mention the EN ISO 23386 and 87 later, there is possible C construction, product Europe, uh, construction product regulation revision. There is the new position about UK and, and CE marking, obviously the introduction of different off levels and EU Green Deal. Um, um, the new uh, regulations driven by safety and environmental consideration, but also the whole material lifecycle management. So there's an emphasis on um, now digital logbooks in, in again in Europe. Uh, there's emphasis on um, the environmental product declarations as well. Uh, we also see in a push uh, of EPDs to be part of um, the declaration of performance. Um, we also see in the, the kind of trying to back to my point about the resilience. We also see in quite a lot of plants are being digitized um, and the whole uh, kind of um, um, industry forward all. So how uh, manufacturers can really optimize their operations, making it more resilient, even in the COVID situation, how you can keep distancing using AI um, and using using different types of technologies to keep uh, workers safe and keep the plants going as well, because it's uh, it's it's something um, manufacturers have to deal with. So I, I thought I will mention some EU initiatives uh, which are probably worthwhile paying attention to. I know UK is obviously out of EU, but we want UK to be competitive in the uh, in annex and being able to really uh, as a UK uh, export uh, into into Europe. So some of that that is I, I would mention the I mentioned already EU Green Deal. There is also a the European Digital Strategy. If you're not aware of that, uh, I think worthwhile reading as well. Because there's a clear, there's a really a high political goal to digitize the construction sector in Europe uh, to gain productivity and carbon neutral neutrality as well. So there's a big push on the nearly zero energy building, establishing common kind of market construction platforms, so establishing common standards, obviously. And that common construction platform is where the that's the DigiPlace uh, initiative, which is funded project uh, by European Commission about defining a horizontal platform for construction, some kind of reference framework uh, as well. And then we have Construction Alliance 2050, worthwhile mentioning it is a platform set up uh, on an initiative by FIEC, the Federation of the, of the European Federation of SMEs, together with European Builders Confederation, um, Construction Products Europe, uh, Committee for European Construction Equipment, and some other, I think about 40 organization. So, so again, it's a, we can be seen a lot of these uh, you can see a lot of these different groups are forming and it's it's difficult to keep a keep a track on it. But uh, and then last but not least is also um, the 2030 sense and like strategy uh, which has been uh, recently published as well, um, looking at the the kind of uh, holistic approach to different value chains, standardization and and, and pushing standardization and and uh, digitalization. So I thought I would highlight, um, and they and this is a I've taken it from 
a recent presentation which was done, I think it was last week, I believe. Um, it was a web sensor like webinar about building information modeling and how it supports digitalization of standards for construction sector. So I thought it would be good to um, to share that with you because I'm not sure if everyone um, has been able to uh, attend this webinar. So I picked up some of the highlights and there is a link, would be a link to the CENTC 442 work program. Um, so, so this slide shows the relations um, and uh, of the different BIM standardization. So from Europe perspective, sense and elect, sense EC442 to the international standards, uh, to industry standardization like building smart, uh, EU commission, EU BIM initiatives. Um, so, and, 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 the, and the strategies to develop standards are to collaborate with all of these standardization bodies in Europe, also adopt relevant international standards and collaborate with international standardization bodies like Building Smart, and also standardize how to use international BIM standards in Europe and develop some kind of European, obviously, and international BIM standards when needed to support Europe strategies, regulation and market needs. And, and obviously this would not be, the standardization cannot be done uh, within C CEN TC442 alone, because you can see it's a complex structure of the different committees. We have also the, as we call it, the different technical committees of different, uh, of different product groups and systems. So it's, it's very, it's, 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 uh, it's very complex and it requires also government uh, standardization bodies to collaborate. So there's been also a BNI agreement on uh, done on legion systems and uh, to uh, enable this uh, this collaboration. And I'd like to and and, so, and some of the sorry I, I mentioned also some of the examples are uh, of the BNI agreement. Their ISO leads um, is the EN ISO 19650 series as an example. Where SEN leads that's uh, the EN ISO 2386. Um, again, I've taken the screenshot of the uh, from the webinar, which explains the standards in terms of how, uh, and it, it has about three parts. The standards has three parts. I think good to say, uh, the standards is about how to define properties and group of properties uh, with a set of attributes based on existing standards and regulations. It also defines how workflow to author and maintain a dictionary and how interconnect how to interconnect these dictionaries so it's it's really about digitizing existing standards regulations where do exist industry requirements like bream lead kobe regulations which are that's the different standards regulations so when we talk about regulation it's more likely the harmonized standards european assessment documents so i mentioned earlier construction product regulation as an example some existing standards like e and iso and how you take the document, uh, how you how you use the, prop the right properties in this example within the dictionary like thickness, width, performance, thermal conduct conductivity, coefficients, reaction to fire, and how that information, how the properties in the dictionary are used across the, the supply chain, across the value chain. So then we really can overcome the issues we've been facing where uh, we have lots of data pools, lots of classifications, um, Construction Products Europe did their research back in, I think it was 2017. Um, we tried to look at um, how many data pools or data related BIM platform are on the market, in European market. And back then was about 285, 285, all structuring data differently or classifying data differently. So potentially you can think about that for one product property as a manufacturer, you can have a probably over 9,000 different combinations. So it, it, is, it is a bit of, a, um, bit of a, a, an issue, and I think these standards has been long overdue. And the second supporting standard is the EN ISO 23387, which is actually describe a con concept of data templates. So when you use the, the previous standard, uh, you use the sources, you have the properties for the dictionary and how you create a, a template and that template how that is again it could be shared and used by others so it's about really creating and structuring the data making the data interoperable and overcome the issues of uh, basically ev uh, every data pool structuring and naming um, attributes and describing them in a different way so these are the two sorry two key standards uh, they've, they've, they've been finally published, they've been long overdue, and it's been an effort, really collective effort, 
of the whole uh, Synthesis 442 WG4. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's taken about four years to develop. This is just an example. I don't want to go into details, but again, uh, in the webinar, which is very useful to look at how, for example, the EN ISO 16757 um, fits and how the how the 23386 and 87 sits in uh, in a process framework uh, of the other standards like 16757, uh, and it's only part of that jigsaw. So this is an example of an application uh, within uh, one of the other standards. So to summarize, it's really building uh, manufacturers in general facing uh, some of these, uh, some fundamental data related requirements. I would call it really now specific data related requirements because manufacturers must structure the data which would enable them uh, and understand their data really and information management, um, understand IT, OT security risks. So the, not just the, uh, IT risk, but also the operational uh, operational risks as well. We've seen a lot uh, a use of IoT, exponential growth of IoT, big data. We've seen a lot plants are being automated, and you often we don't see we we we, we don't see a uh, equal investment into security parts. So security risks, I think security will be a big theme, uh, especially now with remote working, and the uh, acceleration of of kind of digitalization. Uh, due to COVID and the need of work remotely and operate things, machines, plants remotely. But they are, um, I did mention, enhanced data, enhancing the data, uh, monetizing the data and use it for new business models. So new interfaces, uh, the servitization leading to increase margins and volumes, not just cost cutting, cost cutting, cost cutting, but creating a, a, a kind of new value pools as, as McKinsey report um, talked about it, um, the latest one last year. And then the new capabilities will come uh, as well uh, if we understand, if manufacturers do understand their data. And, and just some, some of the questions really manufacturers should, should uh, think about, about, about how many software applications do you use? Uh, do you really use platforms or do you use application? What's the difference between platform and a, an application? We again, we see, I think I mentioned it earlier, we see a lot of um, platforms or lots of um, buzzwords that there is, we have a platform, we have platform, platform, but are these really platforms? Are they all connected? Uh, how many additional databases, uh, data pools, BIM platform do you support as a manufacturer? And again, are they all connected? Do, do we know what's happening with the data? How the data, who is monetizing on the data? Why, why should manufacturer pay um, these databases or additional data pools or BIM platform? Why should manufacturer pay? I mean, if a merchant or if a contractor buys a product, they pay for the product. So why should they not pay for the data? Why should not manufacturer monetize on the data? And uh, uh, if it's if I look at it and treat it as an asset, I should be paid for the asset. Same like I'd, I, I'm being paid for a, uh, I would be, manufacturer would be paid uh, for their product. So these are all the topics, but I think um, I like to use uh, I edit this uh, screenshot from the CPA Future Construction Product Manufacturing Report from <clears throat> I think it was October 2016, uh, authored by Steve Thompson. I supported him on that on that on that on that report, and 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 really it's about holistic approach. We need to holistically approach um, built environment and its digitalization, and and the technology is there only to support. It's not going to replace us, and we need to see the industry 4.0 circular economy and the whole intelligence build assets, IoT, big data in, in this kind of one big picture. Otherwise, what we're doing is just basically keep uh, doing, keep only addressing almost a, a piece of puzzle in that big, uh, in that big picture of a digital built environment. So I did mention, I don't want to go into details so much, conscious of the time that the industry digitalization is benefiting, technology is getting cheaper, and it's important that really if you are not watching and you are a manufacturer, don't jump on technology because only the buzzword blockchain, cloud, APIs, you know, we all we all hear a lot about APIs, analytics, yeah, can I have the analytics? Well, it's really important not to jump onto technology. Maybe ask yourself, do you have a data strategy in place? Do you have your uh, kind of roadmap in place? 
really do that first. What's a, what's the definition of a product? Can you define a product? Can you agree in your organization what is a product? Unless you have all of that, the if you jump onto technology first, you always end up in spending money and it will not transform the company. Just an end-to-end -end architectural overview to give you an to idea of like how complex it is uh, manufacturing. And some key takeaways uh, to close it up. Um, building information, not modeling management, is about transforming data to information. So it's about the data, uh, how the data, uh, treating data as an asset, monetize it on the data. Um, COVID has exposed the fragility in supply chain and highlighted the importance of the data. And data must be structured and managed to become useful information. And it's a very complex topic. And uh, and I don't have a, this is a very short presentation. So the complexity of manufacturing is great. Business is complex. Our projects and topics are complex. So presenting this full complexity, uh, it would take much longer. But I would again in, encourage you to really talk to us from um, the team, from the manufacturing uh, from for, for what Sue mentioned is the, the the plain language guide, and what we're trying to do is to really simplify the messages so you manufacturers can make an informal decision what to use, when to use, which technology, and then move on, and then possibly kiss the right frog, which would turn into prints, which would obviously help them to monetize on that data. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, I was on time. <laughs>